Hi, I'm Vincent. I'm a machine learning engineer over at Explosion, which is the company behind Spacey, the popular NLP library in Python, as well as the Prodigy data annotation tool. Prodigy is a modern data annotation tool that helps you train and evaluate machine learning models faster that's also designed to be customizable by developers. As of right now, we have a new release for Prodigy, version 1.12, and it is one of the larger releases that we've made so far. This is why I wanted to make a short video that walks through some of the new features that I think are most exciting. These features include new recipes that integrate with large language models from OpenAI. This integration will allow you to use a prompt to help pre-annotate your data examples. We've also added recipes for prompt engineering for OpenAI, which means that right now you can A-B test your prompts via a recipe or have them compete in a tournament. Besides that, we've also added support for task routers, which allow you to specify how many annotators need to see each example. And these task routers can also be customized such that you can define who gets to annotate what example on the fly. And these task routers were made possible by a brand new backend, which allows us to update the progress bar in the project UI, but it also allows us to just give a little bit more functionality to users who want to write custom recipes. We also made some big additions to the documentation, added a whole bunch of quality of life features, and even some extra recipes. So what I would like to do now is go over some of these changes one by one, just to give you an impression of how you can use them. So let's first demo the new OpenAI recipes. For this demo, I am going to be using this data set as a motivating example. It has some text that you might find on a blog or on a forum that has to do with cooking. Uh, these are all things that users might be saying uh, that are somewhat cooking related. And let's for this use case also imagine that I'm interested in parsing some named entities from this. Uh, there are some dishes, some ingredients, and some cooking equipment that I would like to detect. Then what you could do is you could just use the normal NER manual recipe to get these entities annotated. So let's start that up. When you do this, you will see this familiar interface. I see the sentence that I can annotate over here, and I have these familiar buttons down below. And from here, what I could do is I could start annotating. I could say, well, uh, this is the sauce, that's an ingredient, I think, and uh, I believe that this is a dish, and there is also some equipment. Annotating this way is totally fine, but you can imagine that there is a bit of manual effort involved. I actually have to click and drag over here, and that takes a little bit of time. It will be easier if there was a pre-trained model available, something that could go ahead and already annotate these examples. Of course, a pre-trained model isn't perfect. I might still need to curate and manually correct, but it could be a bit nicer if there was a pre-trained model available. So instead of looking for pre-trained models for this specific task, we might be able to use a general large language model to do this pre-labeling for us. And precisely this is what our new OpenAI recipes do. So let me give a quick demo of that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the command the same. The only difference is that I'm now going to say, let's use the ner.openai dot correct recipe. This recipe is very similar to the normal NER correct recipe that you might already be used to. It's just that this one will actually use a large language model in the loop. I'm also going to remove the blank spacey model because this recipe doesn't need it. Let's run this. When I now refresh this interface, you'll notice that all of these entities come pre-highlighted. I am able to correct uh, the highlighting if I think that there's a mistake. In this case, it's fine. But what this interface also shows me is the prompt that is being sent to OpenAI. And here you can see the command that the recipe is generating on your behalf. And what you can also see is the response that we're getting back from OpenAI. So on your behalf, this recipe not only generates a prompt, but it's also able to parse the required information from the response to turn that into an annotation interface that you see here. In this case, I think this is fine, so I'll go ahead and hit accept. This one also looks fine. But here, I think it's made a mistake. Here, it's saying you can probably sandblast if it's an anodized aluminum pan. And in this case, I don't think that sandblast is a equipment part. And this serves as a nice reminder that, of course, this is still a model. Uh, it's not necessarily going to give you ground truth, and you will have to curate what comes out of it. There are, however, a few things that we can do with this recipe uh, that go beyond what we're doing now. So let's go back to the terminal. So I'm back in VS Code, 
And besides this examples JSON file, I've now opened up a new one called fuseshotexamples.yaml. In this file, I've defined a couple of examples of how I would like OpenAI to annotate the data. For example, if there is this text, then I would like it to parse that this is the ingredient. And you'll also notice the example that I had before that it got wrong, where I'm saying, hey, uh, sandblast, that's not an entity. The only entity in this one is the anodized aluminum pan. What I can do from the command line is I can actually add these examples um, to the prompt. This way, we're going to send a larger prompt with more information to OpenAI, and hopefully this will give it enough context to also make slightly better predictions. So let's run this. If you now refresh, you can actually inspect the prompt and see that it got a fair bit bigger. And you can also confirm that the examples that we added are now part of this prompt. In theory, this should make the predictions that OpenAI gives you maybe just a little bit more reliable, but it deserves to be highlighted that there is still a fair bit of experimentation uh, that you might want to do here just to get the prompt right. Note that if you really wanted to, you could also fully customize the prompt to your liking if you want to describe the task with more words. That's also something you can totally do. But there's another flavor of this recipe that's also worth highlighting. I am back inside of VS Code, and you can see the command that I ran before, the NER OpenAI correct recipe. This recipe will make prompts and then fetch responses from OpenAI on the fly. So that means that while you're annotating, you might actually have a little bit of lag. You might have to wait until OpenAI sends the response back. And this can be fine at times, but if you want to not wait and just download all of these responses in bulk, you can use another recipe for that. For that, you can use the NER OpenAI fetch recipe. The fetch recipe is very similar to its correct counterpart. It shares pretty much all of the same settings. You can still use few shot examples if you like. The main difference is that instead of giving the examples to Prodigy, you're just going to output the examples on disk. And just to give a small preview, you can see that the examples out that I've downloaded uh, contains the same text as before, but now it has all the other information that Prodigy would need in order to render. Note that we also still store the prompt on the example itself, such that you can inspect it if you'd like. And all the way at the end here, you can see that we have these annotated spans and that indeed ingredients and dishes and equipment are being detected. So that means that this file can be used as input uh, for some of the Prodigy recipes that you already have available to you. It's just that this is downloaded ahead of time. So far in this demo, I've shown you how you can use OpenAI as a backend for named entity recognition, but it's good to highlight that we also offer similar recipes for text categorization. It works pretty much in the same way, it's just the format is just a little bit different because we're dealing with classification here. But also if you have a text classification use case, we have recipes available that you can use right away. If you want to learn more, know that there is also a very big new section about large language models in Prodigy on our documentation page, where you can learn about all the different settings, as well as some of the details behind the recipes that I've discussed here. Let's now consider that I'm not interested in doing NLP anymore, but now I'm interested in doing some prompt engineering. I am interested in having OpenAI generate some haikus, and I'm wondering which prompt is best for that. I have one prompt over here that just says write a haiku about a topic. And I have another prompt over here that basically says the same thing, but it has to be a funny haiku. Then in order to judge which prompt is best, um, you kind of want to do a scientific experiment of sorts where you do a blind taste test. And this is something that the AB OpenAI prompts recipe can do for you. The way it works is that you have to generate some prompts um, as Jinja files. These are templating files that are very common in Python. Uh, and then uh, you can pass along a input file that contains all sorts of data that you would like to inject. In this case, I'm interested in injecting a topic. So the topic that I'm defining here is going to get injected here. The recipe is able to then loop over all of these different topics, generating high cues for them, and then you can determine which is best from Prodigy. As a small detail, it's also a good idea to add a separate template that is able to render the topic that you are rendering. You can also add maybe a little bit of context about the annotation instruction here. But just as a quick demo, uh, let's see what the interface looks like when I try to do prompt engineering for haikus on a couple of topics. So there we are. I have two poems that are generated by OpenAI, and they're both about Python. 
Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is that apparently it's not necessarily clear if Python is meant as a programming language or if it's meant as a literal snake. But from here, I can select which haiku I think is best. There's another one about Star Wars. And another one about math. At this point, I've exhausted all the topics, so I can go ahead and hit save and go back to the terminal. Now note that when I exit, uh, I get a pop-up. I'm actually able to see these evaluation results come in, uh, which are pretty nice. But in this case, you could also argue that maybe I'm interested in running this experiment over and over again. Maybe it's fine if I loop over all of these topics uh, more than once. Now to facilitate this, I'm going to use the repeat flag to determine how often I'm going to loop over all of these inputs. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to set it to 10, but you can set it to a number that's appropriate for your use case. And when I now come back, I can start annotating again, and I can see that there are some more haikus that I can judge. So, so far so good. When I'm comparing two prompts, then this is a method that will allow me to do a bit of a blind taste test, and this will help me determine which prompt is best. But what about when I have more than two prompts? And for that use case, we have a new tournament recipe as well. In this case, you can pass a folder full of prompts, and then this tournament will do a clever trick to assign matches between different prompts. And there's a couple of statistical tricks in the background that allow you to say, well, probably this is the best prompt. And when we compare it to other prompts, we can assign a estimate of how likely it is that it is indeed best based on the data that it's seen. And if you're dealing with lots of prompts in the beginning, this can be a great way to narrow it down. Definitely check out the documentation if you want to learn more about this recipe. Now, finally, there's one more OpenAI recipe that I think deserves a little bit of highlighting. Let's say that you're dealing with an NER use case and you're interested in detecting, let's say, skateboard tricks. Then it can take a while to annotate all the data and to then train a model that can perform this task. Instead, it might be more useful as a starting point to have a long list of known skateboard tricks. And there's a couple of methods to make such a word list, but one thing you can do now with this new terms OpenAI fetch recipe is that you can ask OpenAI to generate such a term list for you. So let's say that I'm interested in generating skateboard tricks. And let's say that I want to save that into a skateboard tricks JSONL file. Then OpenAI is going to try to come up with a couple of terms. And there we are. It took a while, but now we have a file. And if we just inspect that a bit, then we see that we indeed have lots of generated skateboard tricks. Uh, and we also have the OpenAI query stored in the metadata. And this can be a great starting point for a named entity task. Now, one thing that does deserve to be said about this term list is that this term list might actually have a few mistakes in it. It is still a statistical model that's giving you these results. So it can be a good idea to still review these manually. If you want to do that, know that we do have a guide on this term recipes in our large language models documentation section, where you can actually see how to turn this JSONL file into proper patterns files that you can use inside of Prodigy. The guide will give you all the details that you'll need. The next big exciting feature is the new task router. But before diving deeper into how it works, it also helps to explain what problem that it solves. Sometimes you're just annotating data on your own, on your own laptop, to get your own training data. But once you start getting more serious, you might deal with a pool of annotators. And when you have a pool of annotators, there's a couple of ways that you can distribute the tasks among them. One method is to say, well, I want to have full overlap. Every example that I have needs to be seen by every annotator in my pool. On the other end of the spectrum, you can also say, well, no, I want each task to be only seen by one person. And then between that, there are all sorts of variants. You might say, well, each task needs to be seen by at least two people. Or certain tasks, let's say German tasks, have to be dealt by the German annotators, and English tasks have to be dealt by the English ones. And this is the field where the task writer comes in. It solves the problem of how to take tasks and assign them to people for annotation. The way that these new task routers work is that it's basically just a Python function that is called at the time when we have to decide where a task should go. The order of things is that there is a session that is assigned to a user, 
And when that session needs a new example to annotate, the backend is going to check the stream of all the different examples. And for each example, it's going to call a Python function that serves as a task router. And then this task router will give a list of all the sessions that a task will need to go to. Progy will come with a couple of task routers that you can use yourself inside of custom recipes. We also have some new configurations to make some standard task routers easy to configure. But you can also totally write your own custom Python functions that handle this task routing for you. And you can really get creative with this. If you want to get started with task routers, note that you don't have to write custom Python code just yet. You can also just configure the right settings inside of your prodigy.json file. In particular, you can use the feed overlap setting that Prodigy already comes with. By setting that to false, you're going to make sure that each example is only seen by a single person. But if you set it to true, then we will get overlap, and then each example will be shown to every annotator that's available in your pool. But the thing that is new is that we now also have this annotations per task configuration. And here you can configure how many people need to see each example. If you set it to an integer, then there will be a task router that will try to exactly match the number here. But what you can also do is you can set it to a floating value. And in this case, the task router will try to meet this average on your behalf. One thing to keep in mind here is that in general, it is a very good practice to set the annotators up front. And you can do that by configuring this prodigy allowed sessions environment variable. By doing this, you are telling Prodigy that only a user Vincent, a user Magda, and a user Kabir will be annotating. And this can be very helpful for the task router because the task router now knows about every single session up front. If you don't set this, then users can join at any point in time, which can make it tricky for the task router to figure out what the total pool of annotators actually is. If you want to learn more about these internals of the task router, we have a new section on the docs all about task routing. That also helps explain how exactly these task routers are built under the hood. Another useful feature of this section of the docs is that it also shows you a couple of examples of custom task routers that you can write yourself. For example, this is a task router that can use a model in the loop. If the confidence score that the model gives is relatively low, then this task router will say that all the annotators in the pool will need to have a look. If the model, however, is very confident, you could argue that it's an easy example, and then only one of the annotators will need to have a look. There's also more examples here, like the one below, where we route examples based on the language of the item. And the thinking here is that you might use properties of the annotation task to route the example to the right user. For example, if the language in an object is Dutch, then you might want to send it to Vincent, whereas if it's German, you might want to send it to Enos instead. Custom task routers are a very flexible and therefore also very powerful feature. But I do really recommend giving this document a good read if you plan on writing your own. There are a couple of caveats related to session creation, and the document does a good job of explaining these details. Before I wrap up this section on task routers, I figured it would be good to emphasize why it's such an important feature. It's not just the fact that we can route tasks to the appropriate annotator. The reason why task routers are so powerful is because they help you unravel annotator disagreement. It could be that you have some examples that are just a little bit confusing, or that there are some examples where there's insufficient context to give the appropriate label. And in these situations, you don't want to blindly pass the annotations downstream to a machine learning model. Instead, you would like to investigate the annotator disagreement. And it's for this reason why you might see more annotators overlap on a task in the beginning of an annotation project, and maybe less later. In the beginning, you just want to make sure that the task is well understood, and these task routers actually give you a way to change the overlap as the project moves forward. And that's quite powerful. Note, by the way, that if you are dealing with multiple annotators, that the review recipe in Prodigy can be very useful. It allows you to effectively see what everyone has been annotating, and it will then also allow you to correct any mistakes. The review recipe is quite flexible as well, because it does support multiple annotation interfaces. Now, one thing that's worth mentioning about these new task writers is that they're made possible because of a big revamp that was made in the back end. If you take a step back, the main abstractions inside of Prodigy right now are a controller, which can be seen as the place where all the settings get parsed. And it's the central object that makes sure that tasks are delegated appropriately. Then we have these sessions, which represent users that are annotating. Then we have a stream, which is the place where the task routing happens. The stream keeps track of queues on behalf of these sessions. And then before that, we have a new source abstraction. 
A source could be a couple of things. It could be a folder of images. It could also be a file with data that needs to be annotated. But it can be seen as a new way of thinking about the input data. The benefit of having a separate abstraction for a source is that you can keep track of where you are. For example, if this is a file, we can refer to the uh, file path, for example. But we can also keep track of where in the file we currently are. And that is something that can be useful if you're building a progress bar. Because right now, we can keep track of where we are in the source independently of where all these sessions are when we are thinking about progress. And this is now also something that you can see reflected in the Prodigy user interface. Now, just to demonstrate the subtle difference that this can make, uh, let's assume now that I just want to do some annotation for text classification and that I have a fairly basic prodigy.json file. Uh, if I now start this recipe, then you'll notice that the progress bar that's shown here indicates that this is based on the source file. This is now something called a source progress. And you'll also notice that as I start annotating, uh, that then the progress bar moves up. And this is because the pointer in the source actually has to move forward in order to read examples that can be passed on to this session. But now, let's make a small change. Let's now say that I'm configuring that I'm going for a total target instead. That's something that you can configure here. If I were now to start up the same recipe again, then you'll notice that the UI indicates that it's now a target progress bar, not one based on the source. And the behavior is also just subtly different. You can see that I can annotate, and the progress bar itself would not update until I actually hit Save. Only when I save these examples into the database do I see that this progress bar moves forward. And although this is a relatively small and subtle change, uh, we do think that this distinction uh, can make a nice difference uh, in the UI. I've just discussed some of the bigger features in Prodigy version 1.12. But there are also just a couple of smaller features that I think also deserve just a little bit of highlighting. For example, the docs now have a big guide on how to deploy Prodigy. A large part of the document explains how you can deploy Prodigy inside of Docker, and also highlights some of the things to keep in the back of your mind as you're deploying. Another new feature is that you can now also use Parquet files as input for your Prodigy recipes. There is also a new filter by patterns recipe that allows you to use patterns files to create a subset of interest for an annotation task. The Prodigy train command can now also do co-reference models. This is handled via the Spacey experimental project. And while it is still a bit of an experimental feature, we did want to make it easier for the community to try it out. And there's also a whole bunch of new Python functionality that we've exposed to the users. One of these additions is the iter dataset examples function. This is very similar to the get dataset examples function, except that this returns a generator instead of a list. And we're dealing with very large datasets from Prodigy. This can actually save a whole bunch of memory usage, which is nice. There's also lots of bug fixes in this release that you can look forward to. And we're also hard at work for the next version of Prodigy, which will add support for Spacey LLM. If you have any feedback about these new features, by the way, make sure that you go to our Prodigy support forum, where you can interact with me and other members of the Prodigy team. Thanks for listening.